CBC Online Church, we kick off a new series called Passion and Pursuit. It's the life and legacy of David. Every summer we walk through a character study and this particular journey leads us on looking at the title of a man who has a heart that chases after God. When we talk about heart, we're going to begin to unfold and unpack the reality of what does it mean to be a person that pursues God and lives for God. We know that God's going to speak to you in a very significant way and we want to hear from you personally. You can email us at nextsteps at communitybible.com or you can check us out online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. We know that your life is a part of something much bigger than itself, and may you continue to say yes and amen to the purpose and plan that He has for you. Pursue God with all your heart until we meet again. Much love. And as we walk into this new series, The Passion and Pursuit of David, you might be new here to CBC, and if you are, please take the moment to fill out that tariff portion, check the box, I'm new here, drop that in the offering box. We wanna tell you personally this week how thankful we are that you would come here, but if you're new here, what we typically do in the summer is we walk through a character study, a biographical sketch of a person in the Bible that we can glean, harvest some principles and precepts from and apply to. Last summer we looked at the life of Joseph. The difference between a God dream and a good dream changed so many lives. And this summer we walked through the life of David. Can I give you a commercial for next summer if the Lord allows us to live that long? 2018 we'll look at the life of Ruth because we wanna glean from men and women as they simply surrendered and submitted to God's purpose. But we look at David. Nobody talked more about the Bible except for Jesus than David. He wrote 73 Psalms. We also understand there are 59 references of David. In the New Testament, there are also 66 chapters in the Old Testament dedicated to the journey of David. Now, there's not much recorded about David before he was anointed as the soon and coming king behind Saul but there are some principles that we can glean from, especially in leadership. And I wanna talk and speak to that issue today under the sermon title, King of Hearts. So if you got a Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and as we get to 1 Samuel chapter 16, may we be encouraged today that there's a God that does not judge a book by its cover. Aren't we grateful for a God that looks beyond the surface into the depths of our hearts and goes after our heart. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He came to give us a new heart. And I wanna to speak to that today. And I wanna begin reading in 1 Samuel chapter 16 in verse one. And if you're with me, 11 o'clock service, come on, say amen. amen. The Bible says, the Lord said to Samuel, he's the prophet, how long will you grieve over Saul? He's the current king of the nation of Israel. I've rejected him for being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I'll send you to Jesse, that's the father of David, the Bethlehemite, that gives us a geographical reference, it's Bethlehem. For I've provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said to him, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Watch this. In the Bible, when a prophet showed up, usually he was bearing bad news. Thus saith the Lord, usually in regards to the sin of of the people. He comes to Bethlehem as he began to walk past houses. There were literally fathers and mothers that felt the sense of relief that he was not coming to talk to them. But all of a sudden, as he walked up on the porch of Jesse's house, the question was asked, do you come in peace? Not, hey, how are you? How's it been? How's the trip? Do you come in peace? All of a sudden, we find out that Samuel says, I come in peace indeed. Notice in verse 6, all of a sudden, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks 
on the heart. Here's what happens. All of a sudden, Samuel says to Jesse, I need you to bring all your sons. Now, Jesse had eight boys, eight sons. But how many show up in this gathering? Seven. Jesse didn't even include David. Do you know that David is the only man in the Bible that has this title, a man after God's own heart? And because of this, what we find out that when we begin to discover what's on God's heart must be on our heart as we pray for the city, we are for the city. And as we are for what God is for, may we understand this primary principle and overarching statement, we have to look beyond the external and look into the heart because that's what God chases after. Now, all of a sudden, there are four principles that are revealed in this passage of Scripture. And I want to begin with point number one. We see the crisis of leadership. The crisis of leadership. That is, the nation of Israel rejected God. They wanted a king. 1 Samuel 8 Verse 20, they wanted a king like all the other surrounding nations. Now, God was that king. God provided for them. God protected them. God fought for them. But in the midst of them comparing themselves to other nations, at that moment, they said, we want what everybody else has, and we want a king. Can I just speak into our house today? Can I speak into somebody's life today? We have been called not to be like everybody else. Now, I thought I'd get a little bit more of some reverb on that one. I, I thought, like at that moment, I, I, somebody would shout me down with a, with a statement of affirmation and acceptance to the fact that God did not call us to blend in, but he called us to stand out. I'll pause to see if anybody will help me today. Yeah. We have been called to be peculiar people. Now, let me clarify that. Not odd for God. I'm talking about we would live different, love different, speak different, treat different by how we walk this out. Peculiar, not from the standpoint that people can't relate with us. Oh, we're very relational. Matter of fact, we seek to look for ever-changing ways to share a never-changing message. We seek to be relevant, but relevance is appropriateness to the subject. We seek to be relevant, but not compromising the convictions in which we stand for, which is Jesus Christ. That was the problem. The nation of Israel said, we don't want you, God, ruling over us. God gives them exactly what they want. They get Saul. Saul was a good man. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else. But somewhere in the midst of leadership, and you'll discover this, when all of a sudden you've been given the opportunity to lead, there is a tendency in all of us to begin to listen more to popular opinion than what God says. Now, let me just say this to us. We don't live for the audience of many. We live for the applause of one, that being King Jesus. One. It does not mean we do not consider opinions. It does not mean that we walk through wise counsel. But at the end of the day, being a leader means that you have to make hard decisions. And sometimes you have to go not just with your gut, but you got to go with God. And usually that will link up and sync together. But when you listen to others more than you listen to God, your heart has a tendency to go awry or away from what God's called you to do. And it's been very clear. There was a crisis of leadership. You'll see that God regretted allowing the people to get what they wanted because the nation of Israel continued to do what was right in their own eyes. Moses, you've heard about. Joshua, you've heard about. The prophets and the judges, you've probably heard about. All of them somehow, someway had this moment of this phrase being the branding statement They did what was right in their own eyes. But God's looking for some people as Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Just TiVo that to your heart. Write it down. Do whatever you gotta do. But Acts 13, verse 22, what made David a man after God's own heart? He was obedient to all his ways. God's ways. All, not partial. And that's the very reason why Saul was rejected. Partial obedience, called to destroy the Amalekites. He keeps the spoil. And then when Samuel rebukes him and says, what have you done? 
all of a sudden Saul begins to rationalize and justify and blame it on everybody else. Can I just say it in a very grassroots way, better yet, maybe a little bit of a salty way, just kind of a statement of this is how it really is. We live in a society that has a tendency and a propensity to blame our junk on everybody else. To blame our junk, that, that's the salty part, our junk on everybody else. But God's looking for some people not to be perfect. We're not gonna be perfect, but we serve a perfect God and therefore we own our mistakes and we choose not to stay there, but we move forward. But once more, the key denominator is we own them. Saul didn't own them. He basically offers a sacrifice unto the Lord that was in essence for good luck. It wasn't about the heart. It was just going through the motions. He sought to live for popular opinion. There was a crisis of leadership. Now let's take a commercial break. Can we take a commercial break for just a second? That's a lot of content we're trying to digest right now. So let's illustrate it. Now I was in Orange Beach, Alabama, the last portion of our vacation. And in the process of that, we're at the beach, which is a good distance from the condo. And so on the way back, we're in beach attire, Flip-flops, board shorts, tank top, ball cap. We see a Domino's pizza. We place an order, waiting on that to be prepared for takeout to take back to our condo. I lay eyes on a TCBY, the country's best yogurt. I said, hey, gang, we're going to eat dessert first. <laughs> to that statement was a resounding yes from our minivan. And in that moment, all of a sudden, we go into TCBY. We place the order, kids are pressed against the window and they're picking and it's coming out and they're not waiting for dad to pay for it. They're devouring it in the moment. Now, you know your pastor's lactose intolerant. All those flavors, there's only one flavor I get to pick from. It's chocolate, nothing wrong with chocolate. I love chocolate. It's silk is the brand of milk that it's made from. How you get milk from almonds, I have no idea, but I'm thankful because I'd have been left out. So here I was with my little cup of ice cream and I'm, I'm eating, so here's the visual. I'm eating as I'm walking down the row here and as I'm eating mid-bite, my phone has this convenient apparatus where you could put a couple cards in there. So I got my driver's license, but there's only two pouches. So I had my driver's license and my American Express. That's all I had. So all of a sudden in that moment, my kids are halfway through the waffle cone. I'm halfway through my cup of ice cream. I lay down the American Express and at that moment, she looked at me and she went, sir, we don't take American Express here. I'm like. I look at my kids and I went. I mean, they, they are mowing down this waffle cone. I look at my wife. I go, baby girl, please tell me. You, you got your purse? She goes, I left it at the condo. I was like, you got some cash in the beach bag? She was like, no. All I got is this American Express. I said, ma'am. I'm going to leave my wife and kids here. <laughs> I knew you were going to laugh at that, but let me finish the statement. So I can go find some money. So all of a sudden, they're just enjoying the air conditioning and eating through the rest of their ice cream. I go down to Domino's. I'm rationalizing this. But meanwhile, I'm praying while moving. I'm going, Lord, help me. I need some help. It's a long ways back to the condo. All I got is American Express. Oh, $15 and some change. And I got to get out of this. God help me. So I go to Domino's and I go, hey, listen, I, I got some pizzas that are coming out in just a few moments. Can you charge me more than what they're actually worth and get cash back? They go, sir, we don't do that here. So I go across the street. I go to the gas station. I grab a pack of gum. I said, can I get cash back if I pay for this and just add a little bit more. I said, sir, we don't do that here. I get out into the parking lot at the gas station straight up. I go, God, I don't know what to do. And out of my peripheral vision, I see a Walgreens and I'm like, I think they do cash back. So all of a sudden I get in line at Walgreens, once more looking homeless. I'm, I'm in the line. The only way this story would be better if if there was a gift card, because there's a lot of different gift cards to different places. If there was a gift card to TCBY, that would have been like, hello. But there was a Visa gift card. And I went, I'm about to gift myself with this Visa gift card in Jesus' name. And in that moment, when I laid eyes on that Visa gift card, I'm just being real. Like, I had a Holy Ghost moment in that line. 
I just went, oh, God, thank you so much. And I get back to the TCBY. My kids are like, where you been? I'm like, I had to find some money. I was waiting for them to come back, for me to come back and see them behind the counter washing dishes. I thought like, <laughs> but here's what I want to say to you. In the crisis of leadership, I did, know, I did not know what to do, but I knew what to do in regards to the fact I couldn't fix it. I couldn't figure it out, but God, I need you. The reason why there was a crisis of leadership is Saul's going, I'm gonna fix it and figure it out, but he was wanting to do it without God. That's why there was a crisis of leadership. God goes, I needed somebody else to step up and step in. Point number two, we see the cost of leadership. Not only the crisis of leadership, but the cost of leadership. Leadership's costly. Now, real quickly for the sake of time. You know, Samuel had been counseling Saul, stop worrying about the opinion of the people. And now when God tells to Samuel, go anoint the next king, Here's what he says to God. You can read this at the very end of verse one, verse two, and then see what happens in verse four. You see that Samuel tells God, think about this. Let me put it in context. Tells God, if Saul hears about this, he's gonna kill me. Now he's talking to the God of the universe. He's counting the cost is what he's doing. This command's clear, God. Is the command clear? Yes, take the horn filled with oil and go. He counts the cost. If I choose to be obedient to you, this could be costly. But as my grandmother told me, yes, leadership is costly. But when Jesus is a part of the choice and counting the cost, it's always worth it. Always worth it to always go with Jesus. And in the midst of that moment, the very words of Samuel to Saul, don't worry about popular opinion. Guess what Samuel's doing? He's worried about popular opinion. But what I love about Samuel is verse four, he went to Bethlehem. He was obedient. I believe in this room, God has given some of you a clear command. You're counting the, the cost. You're going, is it worth it? The answer is yes, if God's a part of it. Here's what you must understand. Wherever God has called you, his provision and protection goes with you. I'll say that again. I, I, sometimes I have a tendency to speak a little fast. Wherever God's called you, his provision and protection goes with you. So you can't worry about what people think. You can't worry about this doesn't add up. Wherever God calls you, his provision and protection always go with you. But as you and I both know, there has to be a moment where you point your feet in that direction and you go. You obey. And the cost is great but the reward is greater. Point number three, write this down. Not only do we see the crisis of leadership, the cost of leadership. Number three, we see the criteria of leadership. The criteria. As we look to 1 Samuel 16, we see, and I've already read this, so let me summarize it. All of a sudden, Samuel is in the house of Jesse. He looks at the birth order being presented. That is, Jesse lines them up from the oldest to the youngest, but David is not there. Now that reveals a lot about Jesse, that he's overlooked his youngest son. But he lines them up according to birth order. And what you'll find out is all of a sudden, here's Samuel looking at the sons of Jesse. All he knows is that the next king to take the place of Saul is supposed to be in front of him. That's all he knows. He's been obedient. And as he lays eyes on the first person, Eliab, at that moment, he begins to take the cap off the horn of oil. And as he's doing it, the Lord goes, he's not the one. He's not the one. Why is it that Samuel began to unscrew the cap to the horn of the anointing oil that would christen the next king? Why? Because Eliab was taller than everybody else. It was in birth order. He was the oldest, the firstborn, and he was taller. Aren't you great? Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Spirit of God. Aren't you grateful? that we serve a God that does not judge a book by its cover? Amen. Aren't you grateful for a God that goes, you know what, to be honest with you, people have a tendency to see in the moment and as they perceive, it's usually based upon appearance, based upon height, 
based upon the external. That's why I love shows like The Voice. When it comes to talent, they're not allowed to look at the vocalist or the musician, but they have to hear them. Because you and I both know there's a tendency in all of us that when we begin to behold something because I, our eye is the lens in which we see things and sometimes we have a tendency to go external. That's not how God sees. God looks at the heart. Now the name Richard Rowe, not one of the sons of Jesse, but Richard Rowe discovered the Rolling Stones. Anybody still listening to the Rolling Stones? Hello. They made a dent on the planet, did they not, with their music. But Richard Rowe is not famous for discovering the Rolling Stones, which he did. He's actually become infamous, as some would say, because he looked at a boy band, a, a quartet from England that led with a guitar style of music and said to them, as they longed for a record contract, I don't think what you guys offer is actually where music is going. Guitar-driven music is on its way out. And he rejected them. Just a few years later, he would stand to live in the consequences of that choice because that boy band, as he called them, was known as the Beatles. And they wrote a song called, Want to Hold Your Hand, that went, number one, skyrocketed, thus propelling them into a career, obviously, in which we're still affected by. But one man looked them in the face and, go, and goes, what I see does not determine that you're going to be successful. Here's what I want to say to you. As God looks at you, here's what's so amazing. This is why I'm about to have this kinetic outburst on this stage in my heart is because God does not see you in the moment. God sees you in what you are becoming and what you will be. Did you catch that? He sees the journey. Some of the greatest and most valuable things in the world are hard to get to. Do you hear me, church? Diamonds, hard to get to, but they take a little bit of mining. Pearls, hard to get to. You got to do some diving. When it comes to gold, once more, you got to do some digging. And as you and I talk about the most valuable things, sometimes are beneath the surface. I'm so thankful that there's a God that's willing to go beneath the surface and get right to the heart. And as he takes our heart, he molds it and makes it and what he wants it to be. Leadership is not about status, not about stature, not about standing, but it's about shepherding. Shepherding. Isn't it interesting? Can I connect the dots for you? Isn't it interesting that Samuel is standing in Bethlehem, which is known for, here's the phrase, house of bread. Where would Jesus be born? Bethlehem as the bread of life. The bread of life. David's occupation was a shepherd. Jesus would say in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. What made David worthy of being selected by God? His heart, but the fact that he cared for every single lamb. See, and I love this statement. It's not original. Simon Sinek, a great author, said this. Leadership is more than being in charge. It's caring for the people under your charge. That's what makes great leaders. Is not just going, I'm the boss, I'm in charge. It's actually caring for the people that are under your leadership. Which means people really don't care how much you know. They just want to know how much you care. That's really what they want to Do you care? Do you really care? And what made David so unique and special is because he cared. How, do we, how would we know that? You'll find out in the next chapter, which next weekend we'll talk about David and Goliath, that he would go after one lamb that was being attacked by a bear and another lamb that was being attacked by a lion. He cared for the smallest of things. And being a leader means we care about the smallest of things that sometimes other people overlook in the lives of people, like birthdays and anniversaries and things that would be called hobbies and values and relationships. We care beyond what they do. We care about who they are. And as we care for who they are, you know what you'll find out when you're in leadership and you care about who they are? Guess what they'll do? They'll give you their very best for you because they know how much you care. And so we see the criteria of leadership. Point number four, write this down real quickly. We see the courage of leadership. It takes courage to be a leader. 
But I love in verse 12, and he sent and brought him in. That is Jesse, when asked the question by Samuel, surely you got another son. Goes and gets him from the field. He's just a shepherd is what Jesse said. Hey, anytime we give a qualifying statement as just anything, understand God, go, God goes, I'm looking for somebody that's been delegated and relegated as just because I'll make them something significant and special. I'll do something supernatural. God has a rich history of taking the overlooked and the marginalized and making them the heroes in the story. He has a rich history of taking people that nobody wants and turning them into people that everybody wants. Why? Because it's God who gets the credit in it. Come on, church, can we clap to that? Would that be all right? Yeah. I'm living proof that God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The fact that I stand before you, and you've heard me say this, my life's like a turtle on a fence post. I don't know how I got here, but the view is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. God, you put me here, and I'm thankful. When it comes to the courage of leadership, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, when David walks in the room, here's the descriptive about David. He was handsome in appearance, but he was ruddy. Do you know what the word ruddy means? The word ruddy, it's only used five times in the Bible. Ruddy means this, fair-skinned and red-headed. I did not know that. When I looked at the word ruddy, I unfortunately had misinterpreted this word ruddy, and I made it synonymous with a movie that I watched one time called Rudy. Now, in that moment, when I think about Rudy, I think about the fire hydrant of a young man that walks into a football field and goes, you're not going to break me. You're not going to stop me. So when I, thought, when I thought Ruddy, I thought Rudy. I thought a young man that was unbreakable. But the word Ruddy means redheaded. Now, I know by looking at me, obviously, I got a lot of gray going on right now. But did you know when I was a kid, I was redheaded? My oldest daughter, London's redheaded because my dad was redheaded and my grandmother was redheaded. Now, obviously, over a period of time, my mom's got black hair, so I, I'm kind of like a calico cat. When my beard grows out, it's white, red, black. But I grew up redheaded. Redheaded girls don't get teased as much as redheaded boys. Redheaded boys get teased. In our culture today, young people call redheaded people gingers. They've been called gingers. And sometimes they're made fun of. I just want to make a correlation and a connection. The person that God says, this is the only man I'm going to say in the Bible that has this title, a man after my own heart, he was redheaded. Now, I'm not saying that about me. I'm saying that in reference to the fact that society, society had overlooked this redheaded little boy. Think about this. He's in the Middle East. What's the predominant hair color? Black or brown. What's the skin tone? Olive, brown eyes. Here's a fair-skinned, red-headed boy that possibly was made fun of. Now, we don't know that. A lot of information is left out. I'm just saying this to you, that God has a rich history of taking people that overlook or overlooked and marginalized and does something great with them. Now, it, it's more than skin tone here. Understand, you may feel overlooked and marginalized, but God wants you to begin to embrace this rising courage in your heart to be what God's called you to be. And I want to close with this real quickly, and I'm going to give you this acrostic. In verse 18 of 1 Samuel 16, I think this is interesting to me. Saul begins to lose his ever-loving mind. Psychologically, he begins to, in essence, and the only way I could say this, the butter begins to slide off the biscuit. <laughs> can, I, can I use a southern expression? Would that be all right? I know we're in the heart of Texas right now, but the butter was sliding off the biscuit right now. He's going mad. Guess what he asked for? He goes, I need somebody that'll play me some music. Well, guess what happens? One of his servants goes, I know a guy. I know a guy. And I want you to watch the description as this marketing pitch for David is being made. Listen to this. One of the young men answered and said, behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing that is, he was a harpist or a guitarist, a worship leader, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. You know what's interesting about this? 
David's 14 to 16 years old. The first three sons of Jesse were in the, in the army of Saul. What's interesting about this is that David was not a man of war. Now you go, Pastor Ed, are you telling me that the Bible is contradicting itself? No, no, no. There's a young man that's speaking prophetically on behalf of what David was going to become. Can I speak prophetically into the 11 o'clock service today? I'm looking into the faces of some men and women, and I want to use the scripture to support this, who are skillful with a talent and a gift and ability that needs to be used. I'm looking into the faces right now of some men and women of valor, some men and women who walk in victories. The Bible says man of war, that you and I would understand that we walk in victory. I'm looking into the faces right now of some young men and young women and some adults that are prudent in speech, and that is you are a person of good presence, and also the Lord is with you. He's with you. And as you and I embrace this, here's what we have to understand. You and I have been called unto significance. Prophetically speaking, it's about our heart. Now, as we get to the word heart, and if I can get some water just real quickly. There's some water right here on the front row. Thank you so much, K-Mac. Appreciate you. Hey, real quick. Kayla McBride, that was a great pass. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. <laughs> Your pastor's got hands. I just want you to know I got some hands. I can catch, right? <laughs> Thank you. The fact that you threw it at me was a tremendous amount of confidence and courage that you knew. <laughs> the fact that you threw it at me was like, my pastor's got this. I'm act <laughs> she was like, He's got this. Thank you for having the vote of confidence that, that I'm an athlete of some sort. <laughs> Heart. I want you to write in these acrostic statements. David was a man of humility. Let me go through these quickly. Endurance. Acquainted. Repentant. Tender. How do we know that David was a man of humility? He's anointed king. Think about this. The anointing oil is dripping off his hair. And guess what he goes back to? Shepherding. He just goes back to work. <laughs> like, we done here? God, I, I know you got something special for me. I'm just gonna go back to what you told me to do. And meanwhile, I'll just wait. I'll, I'll bloom where I've been planted. I'll just wait for you. I'll be faithful in the small things. Humility. Endurance. We're going to journey through the life of David. You're going to find out there's some moments where you, you'll see where David felt like giving up, but there was some endurance in his heart. Come on, look at me. 11 o'clock service, CBC. For you and for me in this journey, it's going to be difficult living for Jesus. The courage and leadership is going to cause us at times to go, is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. And we have to have a no quit attitude. Can I use some improper English today? Like, I ain't quitting. I won't quit. I'm not a quitter. God didn't call you to be a quitter. Endurance. Pain is temporary. Can we remember that? Pain is temporary, but accomplishments forever. Pain is temporary. Acquainted. He was acquainted with God's word. He knew God's word. Acquainted with the scripture. Spoiler alert. Do you know that David ended up, and we'll talk more about this, he murdered a man and committed adultery, and tried to cover it up. But what you'll find out is that David, when he's confronted in Psalm 51, he owns it. That's what made him a man after God's own heart. He owned it. He said, don't take, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He was tender, tender. You and I have been called to honestly go, God, and it's not the organ that we're talking about. The Bible uses the word heart in reference to the seat of the emotion, the will, that we would go, God, everything that I am, I wanna walk in humility. I wanna be a man or woman of endurance. I wanna be acquainted with your word. When I blow it, I'll own it, but God, your spirit, when you speak to me, I will confess my sin. And I wanna be tender to when you speak, I say yes. As we stand together today, could we just stand all across our house today? As we stand today, God 
wants your heart. With heads bowed, eyes closed for just a brief moment. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today, would you give him your heart to allow him to be in complete control of all that you are? It's first by being willing to admit that you are not perfect. The Bible calls that sin, that we have sinned. Jesus died for sinners. And whosoever calls on his name shall be saved, saved from what? Our sin, past, present, and future. No longer to be seen as sinners, but sons and daughters. If you've never made that decision before, I wanna invite you to do that today. You might feel comfortable praying that out loud or pr praying it internally in your heart. It's more about your heart than it is about the words. But if today you desire to become a Christ follower, to make that decision, to receive Jesus, the greatest leader of all times in your life, to lead you, would you just say this to him and mean it from the depths of who you are? Just say this to him, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe that you died for me. And right now, I'm asking you to save me change me. I give you my life. Now with heads bowed, eyes closed today, if you prayed that prayer in faith, trusting in Jesus, would you just be willing to raise your hand right where you're standing? Today, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. I'm looking into the mezzanine area. I'm looking on the floor level. Today, if you prayed that prayer, raise your hand as tall as you can. It's the greatest decision of your life. Hands raised all over this place. And I'm looking all across this room. For those of you that have your hands raised, you can put your hands down. But now that we're looking at each other, that tear-off portion on that listener guide or a bulletin, as some would say, write your name, check the box, I accepted Jesus. Drop that in the offering box on your way out. That's a gift to us today. We're gonna reach out to you this week and tell you how proud we are of you. If you don't have a Bible, take that tear-off portion, fill it in, I accepted Jesus, and go to the guest relations counter out in our lobby area. We have a free Bible that we would love to give you. But right now, we want you to hear the thunderous applause of this hour of people telling you we're proud of you. We love you. We're grateful for you. Yes, Lord. The angels rejoice, and so do we.